The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I want to thank you for joining me these past several weeks, and especially today for our Bible study online. Today, we are at the end of the great 50 days of Easter. So today is the last Sunday of the season of Easter. But I invite you to consider to take the question that we've been asking, the question in our Via Caris, the way of grace, how are we experiencing life as an adventurous following of a crucified and risen Lord? Because even though the season of Easter is over, the liturgical calendar considers each Sunday to be a little Easter in which we remember the resurrection and think about what it might mean to live the life God is calling us to live as resurrection people. As many of you know, too, we're also in Memorial Day weekend. So I was looking up a little bit about Memorial Day weekend, and though it's contested, one of the first observations that we know of of Memorial Day happened in April of 1865, and really following May 1st of 1865. In April, there was a group of former slaves that gathered together in Charleston around a horse track that had been transformed into a Confederate prison. It was there that 250 soldiers died and were buried in a mass grave. On May the 1st, 1865, 1865 there were 10,000 black Charleston residents who joined together with white missionaries, teachers, and school children to walk around that track and carry roses and sing songs of faith. And so that was one of the first instances we have of Decoration Day or Memorial Day. In May 20th of 1865, it became a national observance. Arlington Cemetery still continues to this day to have a time of memorial celebration at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And many cemeteries around the country participate by putting flags by the graves of those who were to be memorialized. So a Memorial Day prayer that I lift to you today says this, let us pray. Oh God, we ask your strength that we might dedicate ourselves to perfecting your kingdom of peace and justice among the nations. Let us give thanks for the many blessings of freedom which we possess, purchased at the cost of many lives and sacrifices and fill us with the courage to, fill our, to fulfill our tasks and in no way break faith with the fallen. We commend these fallen to your mercy and ask that you give them eternal rest. This we ask and pray in your name. Amen. So today, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 15, and 5, 6 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, I uh, hope that you'll find those, or you may just want to follow along on the screen here. The theme for today in our worship service, the sermon title is Finding Joy in the Fiery Ordeal. And that's a language here that we take from First Peter. I was talking with a friend just yesterday who was commenting to me that it was a challenge for her to see a light at the end of the tunnel. She wondered aloud, like so many of us have, of when are we going to return to normal? I just can't see it. And as I mentioned previously in another Bible study lesson, I think it's important to know what we think about when we think about returning to normal, because I think this time apart gives us the opportunity to process and reflect on the things that truly matter to us. My hope is that when we get back together, we will have realized the importance of gathering together as a faith community, how much we've missed it, how much of it means to each other to just be together. And so that we will commit again to the Via Caris way of life that reminds us that we are called to worship together with the body of Christ each week. It's good for us, but it's also good for all of the others we are nurtured, but we also minister. So I hope that that's something that we can learn. Because during this time, it is my hope that we use our time apart creatively to think about what it means for us to more effectively love God with everything that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. 
the path in First Peter articulates the hope for the revealing of the end, the revealing of the fullness of the kingdom of God. And not just as something that's far distant in the future, but something that gives us a vision of how we might live our lives today, how we might live out our faith in each moment of each day. It helps us to more clearly see our conditions that we find ourselves in. And though it may be tempting to follow the ways of culture, of the world, that calls us to look out for ourselves, to do what we want when we want it. That's a temptation if we are not oriented each day to following the way of Jesus. We can lose that transform, that sense of transformed belonging that make us distinct people, that make us the body of Christ, that aren't looking out for ourselves primarily, but are actually trying to be a witness to the world of the way of grace and love and peace and truth. And in everything that we do, people should look at us a little bit askew and think, wow, I would love to be like that. That is so different than the way that the world works. We want to be a vision of the kingdom of God here on earth. And First Peter redirects our attention to the glory of God made known to us in Jesus. And that glory that will establish within us both now and at the end, patience, humility, and mutual service for the sake of the kingdom. So let's read the text together. And listen for the words or the phrases that may stand out to you today. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory which is the Spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter here begins by addressing the believers as beloved. Beloved. It's the same address he used in, in chapter 2, verse 11, which began a new section of the letter. However, in 2.11, it's beloved, I now urge you, which was a common phrase to talk about this is a new section of the letter. But here, following beloved is not I urge you, but is a different kind of indication. It shows that this is not a new section of the letter, but it's designed to ease the shock of what comes next. So beloved, do not be surprised. The two commands that are given are positive and negative. So you have do not be surprised, which is a little bit on the negative, so be ready. But then you also get in 14 a sense of blessing, or 13, excuse me, of, of rejoicing insofar as we share with Christ in his suffering. So these two commands to not be surprised and to rejoice in the midst of suffering, neither of these are easy to obey. We want to be in control. We don't like to be surprised. Um, but throughout the Gospels, Jesus wants us to see things differently. So we think we know how things go as the world brings them, but 
Peter and others, Jesus, tells us that the kingdom of God is surprising. And yet the way the world will respond to the, the coming of the kingdom of God is not surprising. People are going to take it and think that the followers of Jesus are so strange because of the distinctive way they live out their love and faith that it, it makes them confused and, and think of the followers of Jesus as, as something strange. So don't be surprised at the ordeal that is taking place. So Peter begins this kind of with a tender word. <clears throat> the unchristian neighbors will be surprised at the new way of life that these believers are following. But we shouldn't be surprised by the way that they withdraw from us. And the verb translated surprise here has the same root meaning as the word strange. So I think, yeah, the King James Version translates it this, Beloved, think it not strange. Don't think of it as strange that the fiery ordeal is taking place among you to test you. And so it's, something, it's not something strange that's happening to us. It's our natural reaction to consider painful situations as strange. But Peter is able to draw upon all the scripture of the Jewish people and to see how God was present with them in a salvation history that traces back to the beginning of time. And so his Gentile readers may not have understood all of that, but his Jewish readers actually have an opportunity to connect themselves to that salvation history. So Peter describes what his readers are facing as a fiery ordeal. And the Greek word he uses here, uses here fiery, um, has multiple meanings. It obviously could mean burning. Um, as such as cooking. It's used as cooking and searing of a wound. But it's also used in a phrase to purify metals. So it's a, a word of purity. And it was used figuratively at the time to talk about a test. And I think that's what Peter has in mind here. The fiery ordeal, as he says, is something that tests you. It's a purifying act. But it comes through people who are speaking poorly of you, people who are reviling your name because of your following of Jesus. There are no evidence at this time that people were tortured by fire, even though that is something that um, later became one of, the, one of the ways to torture. But I think here he's primarily thinking back to Proverbs. Proverbs 27 tells us that a fiery ordeal is a proof, is the proof for silver and gold, but a man is proved by the mouth of those who praise him. So the fiery ordeal is the testing and purifying of gold and silver, but those worth is proved by those who look at them and and and, um, and praise them for the life that they're living, the way of Jesus. So the Apostle Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians 10 that God is faithful and he won't allow us to be tested beyond what we can endure. But with the testing, he will provide a way out so that we may be able to endure. So the testing is may feel unbearable, but God is with us in the midst of it and gives us the opportunity and gives us a way out of, of that testing so that we can endure it to the end. We are called to endure, to be resilient, to faithfully follow Jesus to the end. So, to the degree that we share in the sufferings, we should not be surprised. Now, this also doesn't mean that we should um, seek out suffering. That's not what is being said in here. It's the fact that suffering is going to happen, and we rejoice in that suffering insofar as recognizing that Christ also suffered, and it helps us get more of a sense of his deep love for us when we actually struggle as well. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But there's no hint here that Peter believed that Christian suffer, suffering would atone for our sins in the same way that Jesus' death atoned for our sins. 
In fact, if the suffering is unjust, then that's where we experience the glory. But if we, if it's just, if it's unjust, I mean, if it's, if we're being, if we experience suffering because we've done the wrong thing, then it is of no good to us. So you have 14 and 15. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Sounds a lot like one of the Beatitudes. And if you're reviled, you're blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But then 15 gives the warning, let none of you suffer just because you're doing wrong. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or a criminal. And I think at this point, his readers would say, yes, we shouldn't murder, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't act criminally. But then he throws in this other phrase too, or even as a mischief maker. Some translations say meddler. And I think that's an interesting translation, but the King James Version uses the word busybody. Let no one of you suffer because you're a busybody. Getting in other people's um, business. A long time ago, I was praying the Lord's Prayer, and it was, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I've always just immediately thought of the word trespasses as sin. What are, forgive me for the things I've done wrong as I forgive those who have done wrong things to me. But when I actually broke down that word trespass one day in prayer, I realized that trespass is getting, it can mean getting on someone else's property. And it made me think about it. What it means for me is forgive my trespasses is forgive me when I get in somebody else's business. When I try to put my own beliefs and way onto them and judge them and forget, help me to forgive others when they get in my business, when they judge me or make suggestions for me for the things they think I should be doing. Let us forgive one another when we, when we move into this. Let's forgive one another when we become a mischief maker, when we, Let's forgive the busybodies in our life and let us not be a busybody ourselves. So I think there's some different wordings to think about that. But Peter is clear throughout all of this that some people may deserve their suffering, but he demands that the readers, the believers, not do anything that brings suffering on themselves. That if they are doing the right thing, if they are just and they experience suffering, they are doing the same thing that Jesus himself did, who went to the cross not because of his criminal acts or as a murderer or a thief or even a mischief maker, but because he was, he loved everyone, even those who are on the margins, and he was a threat to the power of the empire and a threat to the power of the church leaders. And so they thought sacrificing him would help them regain their power. And so this is kind of one of the things that Jesus goes to the cross for, nonviolently, sacrificially, to pour out his love for all of us, that we might receive his forgiveness, even when we know not what we do. So this gets to one of my favorite sections of the text. One of my mom's favorite verses is verse 7 in 1 Peter 5. Here it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It should be noticed that this verse is in the plural. So when we get to the word, cast all your anxiety on him, the your is the community. It's not just individual. Cast out all all of your anxiety on him. And that anxiety is probably related to their concerns and worries for their own persecution and seeing themselves cast down by those around them. The way of the church is not just the burden of the individual but and the fear of death, but the concern that the body of believers would not be destroyed so that the witness would stop with them. And that anxiety there, um, sometimes the word is worry, but I really like anxiety because I think we're in an age that anxiety is a word that we're comfortable with. We are all anxious about 
the things that are happening around us. Uh, anxiety almost has a, it's different from worry or fear because at least fear has an object. Anxiety is just some sense of disease around us. But it's also interesting here that uh, in six and seven, there's a period after six, um, the chapter, verse six, but really in the Greek, the word cast is actually the word casting. So it really is a flow from the verse before it, and I think should probably be looked at as one verse. Humble yourselves, therefore, so that God may exalt you in due time, casting all your anxiety upon him, for he cares for you. So I think, you know, the way in which we humble ourselves before God in this text is to cast our cares on him. So humility is a big part of this. Casting our anxiety on God is an act of humility. And God, at that point, exalts us in our due time. When we worry, we can be overly critical. We can look at ourselves and think there's something wrong with us. Um, and what we do is we try to move into control situations. Again, like I said, get back to normal. But in this text, God wants us to cast all cares on him. It's not, by the way, this is not being a doormat. Humility is not something that we do so that others can have power over us. I think someone said humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. Um, I think I have this Brene Brown quote, yeah. If we truly want to live in a world that is kinder and more just, we must hold ourselves to a high standard of civility and humility. So this is Brene Brown, the um, social worker and speaker, talking about here that this is not, humility is, is a standard by which we hope to create a world that is kinder and more just, more loving, not just to be a tail between the leg, legs lapdog, as someone once said. It's not self-deprecating, but it's just the opposite. It's recognizing that our worth is found from God. It's knowing that we are beloved children of God in whom God takes great delight. It's not trying to prove ourselves over and over, not trying to do something that makes us think, oh, this will make God love me more, or recognizing that we've done some things we shouldn't have, and that might make God love us less. With humility, we cast everything into God's presence in his light and love and know that God loves us with an everlasting, steadfast love. And so this command is positive. Cast your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. We have a loving father, a loving God who invites us to come to him with all of our dreams that haven't yet happened, our hopes our dashed hopes, our fears, all of the things that we struggle with and know that God cares for us no matter what. And so there's a challenge here. What do we do with that humility? And when we turn it all over to God, he calls us to discipline ourselves, to do the things regularly that we're called to do. For, for me, this is the Via Caris. Disciplining myself means that I'm going to have a rule of life that helps me to stay true to the things that I believe in most. So each day I pray a psalm so that I remember the language of Scripture and the emotions that all the psalmists bring into the presence of God. Their fears, their hopes, their dreams, their, their suffering, their ex exaltation, all of those things come before God. I remember each day that I'm a beloved child of God, though sometimes it's hard for me to remember that. But my baptism reminds me that we are all beloved children of God. And so when I eat, I remember the goodness of God. And I remember that right now we can't be at table together, but I remember each of you. And worshiping together is the body of Christ. 
That's an important thing for us to do, to discipline ourselves, to be together each week, to worship, even when we can't be together, to find ways to recognize that we are grateful for God. We're grateful for all the things God has given to us. We're grateful for this community of faith. And so we offer thanks. And we do that by being present with God in worship. And then we go out into the world to care, to be creative, to enjoy the beauty of God's creation. So first, we should pull these things together to recognize the steadfastness that is required of our faith that causes us to resist the evil in this world, the things that pull us away. And recognizing that when we resist, it doesn't mean that we're not going to undergo a kind of suffering. But after you've suffered, it says in verse 10, there's a God of all grace who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ. And I love this phrase at the end, this steadfastness, this battle that we're fighting. God himself will restore us, support us, strengthen us, and establish us. And that's the power of love that is with us forever and ever. Norman Wiersbus, one of my, wrote a book that I really love, The Way of Love. And I was thinking, as I was reading this text, our, our ten, temptation to move away from trusting God with all that we are leads us toward what he calls idolatry. And here are some of his statements, and I'm, I'm going to read these, so I know you can read them too. But to, to be idolatrous is to be incapable of delighting in things as they are. Because things are now seen as valuable insofar as they serve our personal needs, desires, and expectations. So idolatry, first of all, is uh, not being content in all situations, as Paul, as Paul puts it. Really, it turns us into seeing ourselves as what's valuable what serves us, what gives us our own, what makes us feel, fulfill our desires and expectations. He further says an idol is by definition the object that we think will erase our fears and fulfill our desires. So what are those objects in our lives that, that we have substituted for God that will erase our fears and make us feel good about Idolatry and intimacy, he says, are mutually exclusive. We can't have mutual intimacy with God and one another if we're always treating everyone else as an object, as something to erase our fears and fulfill our desires. And he says, you don't need to be a monster to reduce others to the scale of your concerns. All you need is to be afraid, insecure, or impatient. All you need to do is replace your primary trust in God with an exclusive trust in yourself. So we become the idols. We, in our sense of control, replace God because we only think we can trust ourselves. And when people are muddled about love, he says, they gradually lose sympathies to recognize each other's need and pain. The imagination to envision each other's flourishing, the commitment to work patiently with others to help them realize their potential, and the joy that cherishes and celebrates the goodness that others are. So this idea of when we are fearful, when we are impatient or insecure, we have a tendency to get muddled about what it means to love, to see other people and imagine their flourishing, to see other people and know that it's not all about us, but how can we care for those needs so they don't just become objects to help us feel better about ourselves. So how do we celebrate the goodness in others? How do we cherish them and experience joy as, because we see them as God's beloved, as children that are made in the image of God? And that we see all of these things, as I said, cast all your cares on him. That, that's a community statement. We're all casting our cares on him because he cares for us all. I also love this prayer that we pray weekly on Wednesdays. It's the prayer of St. Francis. And as I've been thinking about our time together and the suffering that so many people have gone through with COVID-19 and the situations we find ourselves in, whether it be friends or family members who have been sick, um, grieving the death of loved ones, 
not being able to spend time with those we love most. Feeling lonely because we're stuck at home a lot. Those are so many things that we should lament over. We lament and recognize that things are not as they should be. And we pray and think about how they might be and how we can participate in that healing. So on this Memorial Day weekend, we may memorialize those who've suffered and died in battle, those who have sought to protect our freedoms, who have given an ultimate sacrifice, and ultimate, they've sacrificed their lives. But we also recognize that the ultimate sacrifice was given on the cross, and that we follow each and every day what it means to be the people God has called us to be. And so St. Francis, or at least the prayer attributed to St. Francis, reminds me of this, that calls us to be instruments of God's peace. And where there's hatred, we bring love. Where people are hurt, we bring forgiveness. Where there's doubt, and there's a lot of doubt out there, we bring that trust of faith. And many feel despair. How can we be agents of hope and light and joy? So the second part of this just kind of sticks with me a lot, too, because it's so hard. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. It's not about me. It's about how can I share the love with you to be understood. I want to be understood. But how do we first understand to be loved as to love? For it's in giving that we receive. It's in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. That's the prayer for peace during this Memorial Day weekend. It's the prayer that we bring as we come to the end of the season of Easter, recognizing that Easter never ends. Easter will continue forever. And it is a joyous adventure that we partake. Following the risen Christ into the way of love, the way of grace. It takes a lot of intentionality. It takes a lot of for us to, to pull this together and say, it's not just about what I want in this moment, but it's about how can we love one another, love God more fully, and grow in our faith during this time together. So I thank you for joining me for Bible study together and thinking through some of these things. I also invite you to send me some stories. I want to know what you're doing during this time that's helped you to grow in your spiritual formation. Are you taking walks and pondering the beauty of God's creation? Are you watching with your family the worship service each week and singing the hymns together in your, in your, on your couches? Um, are, have you gathered together with some friends in small groups around the town to encourage one another? Are you just simply bringing food to the church? Because we've had wonderful responses. What are the things that you are doing to increase the kingdom of God, the recognition of the kingdom of God here on earth? How are you growing in your spirit? And how are you caring for one another during this time together? If you've got some great stories, I hope that you'll share them with me. I want to bless all of you and hope that you have a wonderful day and that in all things, may the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm, and may he one day bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Thanks be to God.